this lieutenant colonel is not going to challenge a decision of the commander in chief for whom I still work. And I am proud to work for that commander in chief. And if the commander in chief tells this lieutenant colonel to go stand in the corner and sit on his head, I will do so. That notion troubled Senator Inouye, a combat hero of World War II. He reminded Colonel North of the military code of a soldier's duty. The uniform code makes it abundantly clear that it must be the lawful orders of a superior officer. In fact, it says members of the military have an obligation to disobey unlawful orders. This principle was considered so important that we, we, the government of the United States, proposed that it be internationally applied in the Nuremberg trials. And so in the Nuremberg trials, we said that the fact that the defendant Chairman, act... may I please uh, may register I, an may objection? I, my I find this offensive. I find you're engaging in a personal attack on Colonel North, and you're far removed from the issues in this case. Colonel North's lawyer deflected Senator Inouye, but some of North's fellow officers watching on television took issue with the colonel. I'm two years senior to Oliver North out of the Naval Academy, and the only thing he's got on me is a silver star and six more years in the Corps. And when Oliver North started to say the things he started to say, I literally wanted to throw things at my TV set. I seriously considering mailing my Naval Academy ring back to the Naval Academy and denying ever having gone there. I was so embarrassed and humiliated that a professional military officer would stoop to the dishonor and disgrace and warmongering that Oliver North and Poindexter and McFarlane and the rest of the crew did, selling arms to the Iranians after they blew up the Beirut barracks, after they blew up the Beirut embassy, is the most immoral thing. That's like selling Zyklon B to the Germans after you found out the Holocaust is underway. One of my drill instructors in the Marine Corps, by the way, we're talking about, at that time, there were a lot of protests in Washington, D.C., and somebody said, well, those commie lovers or whatever. And the drill instructor told us something as we were about to graduate. He said, what you're fighting for might be wrong or right. Nobody really knows. But he said there's a constitution that allows those people to be out on the streets protesting. He said that's what's worth fighting for. That's what the constitution is. He said that's what you took an oath to. And when you put those bars on as a second lieutenant, you better remember that. I don't think Oliver North had that drill instructor. It was career military men who managed the Iran-Contra debacle under Reagan and Casey. North, Poindexter, McFarland, Secord, Singlaub were all trained to fight wars, not run foreign policy. In war, the aim is absolute and simple. Destroy the enemy, no matter what. They had little understanding of politics in Iran, Nicaragua, and most important, in Washington. Our foreign policy has increasingly become a military policy. Ronald Reagan has doubled the number of military men on the staff of the National Security Council. What was created in 1947 as a civilian advisory group to the president has become a command post for covert operations run by the military. Far removed from public view and congressional oversight, they are accountable only to the one man they serve. The framers of the Constitution feared a permanent state of war with the commander-in-chief served by an elite private corps who put the claims of the sovereign above the Constitution. This is the first page of an order uh, signed and approved by President Reagan. This is the ultimate weapon of the secret government, the National Security Decision Directive, the NSDD. Every president since Harry Truman has issued them. They're not published in any government register. Ronald Reagan has signed at least 280 such directives. They cover everything from outer space to nuclear weapons to covert operations in Iran and Nicaragua. In essence, by an arbitrary and secret decree, the president can issue himself a license to do as he will, where he will. And the only ones who need to know are the secret agents who carry it out, the Knights of the Oval Office. You have testified that as a member of the National Security Council staff, you conducted a covert operation. And my question is, uh, 
did the president specifically designate the national security council staff for that purpose i think what i have said consistently is that i believe the president has the authority to do what he wants with his own staff that i was a member of his staff that mr mcfarlane was and that admiral poindexter was and that in pursuing the president's foreign policy goals of support for the nicaraguan resistance he was fully within his rights to send us off to talk to foreign heads of state to seek the assistance of those foreign heads of state to use other than u.s government monies and to do so without a finding 